Hi guys, I'm here with vlog 75 um, This one, as you know, I've not been very well at all recently So this one's kind of continuing with that thread of affairs And I've called it um, between a rock and a hard place And you'll know if you follow my blogs, I use that expression a lot When I'm describing what it's like to live with chronic health problems Because it's so regularly on a daily battle Feels like you're between a rock and a hard place Like there's just no way to manoeuvre out of a situation because you can't get rid of the health problems but likewise trying to live with them and make them better with doctors that don't communicate and a, full, a, a health service that's falling apart um, is really impossible so it's like being between a rock and a hard place. Um, so I'm just doing this one today because I'm not feeling up to recording much more than that. Um, I wanted quickly to go over before I start talking about like what's going on at the moment in my life um, I wanted to kind of just do a quick sum up about my blogs because I feel like and I'm kind of glancing at my notes because I actually wrote this down in the middle of the night I just woke up and it came to me and I thought yeah that sounds right that's probably the most straightforward way of describing it so I'll scribble it down and then I'll repeat it in my blog so I know that um, I keep going back to, to particular themes and topics that are very close to my heart um, and that's kind of what drove me to create the blogs in the first place and so one of the main themes of that is better treatment for people with chronic health problems um, but in particular invisible Ill invisible illnesses like what I have um, PCOS, endometriosis, lupus all the conditions where you look completely normal but you are actually quite ill and can be as ill as someone sat in the wheelchair next to you it's just you look completely normal um, so they're kind of driving things for me that I keep kind of, I know I keep repeating, but um, I feel like if it's just my voice, no one's going to really listen. Like there must be a lot of people out there as well that do blogs and no one is ever really going to pay attention to it. But I'm hoping that with time, these blogs gain traction and that if we can actually build up a following um, and of people who have similar stories to me and you know, want to improve the health service and want their voice heard for maybe an injustice that was done to them medically or, you know, feeling also like I often do, like they're abandoned and left just to deal with things and receiving um, basic, not even that, um, levels of care sometimes. Um, but I feel like if we can build up a community that shares that and shares a desire to want to see our healthcare system improved and back to its former glory years ago, um, then I feel like maybe, maybe, um, you know, people might prick up their ears and listen and actually think about change and what we're saying. Um, I think that there's power in numbers. And until, you know, a few years ago, I generally thought that I was just quite a bitter person and that I just needed to snap out of it. That's how a lot of people made me feel. But then when I started hearing from people who actually were saying, actually, I'm like you and I've had similar experiences and I'm not happy with that and I had this happen and it was really awful and it's traumatised me, etc, etc. Then I actually realised, actually, no, I don't need to snap out of it. There's nothing wrong with me because there are many other people who are actually out there who are saying that they feel the same way. Um, so actually, I think it's quite reasonable and understandable that I feel that way because of what's happened to me. And um, I know that you know, there will be people that will always disagree. Um, but the crux of it is, the truth of it is, is that our health service, um, it, this sounds a little bit cruel, but this is what I found in my own experience and what other people are saying to me that they also agree with. Um, and this is not to say this is the same across the board because I know that within our health service, there's a lot of different trusts and different kind of funded unions and companies and some of them some clinics and some places work a lot better than others some of them are really great compared to others but on the whole is this one big monster it doesn't function and they don't communicate and this is why so many people are falling through the net and why so many ill people especially chronically ill people are just not receiving the support that they need to live with all the problems that they've got daily um and i feel like and like i said this might sound cruel but this is just from my own experience um, that, you know, the healthcare system has this wonderful caring facade, um, but underneath there are some, actually some very cutthroat people working in that system. 
Um, and I've seen them in action with my own eyes in our local hospital. And, um, you know, they the truth of it is that they don't want to be paying for chronically ill people. Um, I'll, I'll try and elaborate on that because you might be like, well, what are you on about? Because surely chronically ill people make up a huge force of why we need a healthcare service, which is completely true. Um, but basically, you know, I feel like from how I've been treated and how I know other people now have been treated, that there seems to be this kind of grey area, if not a slight discrimination, I would describe it as, which I find bizarre, considering the hospital there is there to serve also people that have long-term conditions, not just who come in acutely ill, need treatment and then go home and are fine. Um, but I feel like they don't like to treat chronically ill people because they know that chronically ill people are going to require more tests, more checkups. Um, a closer level of kind of uh, support than someone who's not and that all amounts to money and when you're looking at a service that is already trying to cut wherever they can and doesn't have any extra funds etc etc I suppose it's understandable but the problem with that is that it means that the people who are chronically ill with the invisible illnesses are the ones to su suffer the biggest out of everybody because they need it's not their fault that you know they need I need we need um, s certain requirements of our treatment in order to stay well and if they're not met we get sick which it, it kind of is ironic and a bit stupid because then if they avoid wanting to do tests and regular checkups on us then we'll probably end up in A&E at some point anyway critically ill because they haven't done the care to avoid getting to that situation um, and that's generally definitely in my local hospital anyway that's definitely how they, they make me feel um, and it feels like you know Often also when you're chronically ill, the tests that you need to see whether something has changed or something's got worse are more costly than um, tests that, you know, if someone just walked in off the street and they said they felt this and that, you know, a doctor would just pull together a selection of tests that they would want doing. Um, but with chronically ill, there's a lot more planning needed and kind of figuring out, well, piecing it together a little bit more like a puzzle. It's not a straightforward thing, as you'll know if you've been following my blogs, because my health has been anything but from straightforward. It's never straightforward. It's always the most unusual thing or the most complicated thing or caused by the most mundane thing you would never notice. And that's why for me, it takes a very experienced specialist or consultant to actually give a bit of time to sit and actually actually consider and appreciate and actually recognize that my life is worth something and that I can't achieve my potential when I'm this ill um and you know there's nothing I can do about that I require their help and if they don't help me I'm stuck I'm between a rock and a hard place um so I feel like that's why thousands of chronically ill people are sat at home kind of crippled with pain um just waiting for help because it's the healthcare service that doesn't want to spend the money on them or the support on them. And it sounds really harsh, but, and also damning. Um, but you know, this is just from my own experience. Um, and others are now telling me the same, which makes me feel more bold and more confident to speak out. Because before I was like, well, I'm gonna get loads of people having a go at me saying, oh, don't be so negative. And you know, this service has saved my wife, and my husband, and I know that, I know it saves, thousands of lives but that's what it's designed for that's what it's meant to do but what they don't talk about as much as all the people it's letting down all the people that fall through and all the people because there are people that do end up dying because of complications and problems that this healthcare service has caused um so yeah so I feel like I've got to stand up for that because it's a principal thing for me it's like really deeply ingrained in me um and you know, I feel like, as I said, when someone's normal and healthy and they exhibit certain symptoms, they're more likely to get help because statistically it's easier to treat and diagnose someone who doesn't have other chronic health problem. Um, they're not such a heavy burden on the healthcare system, which means basically it's a very, very lonely place when you're chronically ill because unless you keep fighting your own corner, um, no one will, um, it's like, no, no one will and you'll just, no one will care and you'll suffer indefinitely. Um, and when you're really unwell, you don't feel well enough to fight your corner. And that is why so many chronically ill folk just don't speak up um, about the poor care because they are drained and emotionally exhausted um, and feel like no one cares. And when you're made to feel that way, after a while, you, you start to believe it emotionally. And I would just, I would like to see care for chronically ill improve but it needs to it needs fundamental changes not just little things it needs fundamental changes 
Um, there's a lot of discrimination and stigma attached, especially to those with invisible illnesses. So I was talking about PCOS, endometriosis, lupus. There's just not enough appreciation and understanding around them. And you still get healthcare professionals who are kind of like, oh, well, it's not as bad or it can't be that painful because you look fine. And that really, I don't understand that. In our day and age where we've come so far in medicine, why there are still healthcare professionals, and especially, I've got to say, especially nurses and the people that help you at the bedside. Um, I have had a lot of discrimination from them um, because I look young and I've physically got quite a fit body and they just don't appreciate and seem to understand what's going in, on inside my body and how much I have to cope with. And that's really demoralising. Um, and yeah, it it's... If you're unlucky enough like me to have complex health, then nothing is straightforward, as I've always been saying. Um, and it, I feel like there needs to be equality for how everyone is treated, and there just is not that um, across the healthcare system. And as I said, there are some trusts, some clinics, some particular hospital trusts that deal with things better than others. I can think of a few places I've been where they've been much, much better with me, much kinder, much more understanding. Um, but the problem is that there shouldn't be this kind of different fluctuating level of level of care it should all be on the same level and it's not so you can go from somewhere that's okay to somewhere that's atrocious that you know you just are like god should i just formally complain about this that and that because they've actually done something that was potentially dangerous to me um and i'm not talking about little things and people are like oh don't be so pernickety um you, you know just because a, a healthcare professional made a comment that upset you that's rubbish to me i'm much thick, thicker skinned than that i'm talking about stuff that's really really hurtful or really detrimental to you like um giving you a drug that's potentially dangerous not listening to you um when you're actually saying really important stuff um patronizing you and making comments about your health uh problems when they don't understand it or they haven't felt it it's just stuff like that which i always say goes back to basic training which i feel is seriously lacking in our healthcare system in england um and i'd said for ages also you know i want these blogs to stand as a united front for chronically ill, um, to say that we are here and we do matter. Um, and it's like, you know, how much is a life worth? That's kind of my question to them. Um, not a lot of healthcare staff, you know, they talk about caring about the community and, and people and stuff, but I often feel like, um, I have, for me personally, I feel so frustrated because I know that I have so much potential in life um, there's a lot that I'm talented at and I want to do and I can't do it at present because I'm being shackled down by atrocious symptoms that, you know, I should be getting help and support for and I'm not really, you know, I'm having to beg for the little that I do get and it's often miscommunicated, um, incorrect because they don't talk to each other and it's just basic, basic fundamental stuff that they don't seem able to do. Um, which then leaves the patient as piggy in the middle when you're unwell is just horrible. It's just like the worst place that anyone can be for anything, really. Um, and there definitely needs to be, you know, need better trust in, you know, chronically ill. If I, for example, you know, if I've had a couple of doctors in the past who were wonderful, they one of them retired recently, the other one changed the clinic he was on. And I really, really felt it when they left and they were no longer covering my care because they were one of just, you know, a handful of doctors that I've seen since the age of 15 who actually respected me, who actually listened to me, who, you know, if I sat there and said, look, this symptom has got worse and I believe this is this, they would look into it for me, they would believe me. And I know you could say that they're saying, well, a lot of people get it wrong and they don't really aren't really in tune with their bodies. Um, and that is completely true. But there are a lot of, especially chronically ill people, because you've had to learn to live with it over the years, who are really in tune with their bodies, and I'm one of them. And actually, statistically, I've always been closer to a diagnosis and more correct than the doctors have when it's come to my own body. So when I'm patronised and not listened to, it is so frustrating because I know that my instinct is right. Um, and it just feels like, you know, there were some doctors who really got that. And at the moment, I haven't got any on my team or my care team that I feel actually really get me or really see me for the struggle that I'm going through and for how for how I want to break out of it. I don't want to be like this. I know I can't get rid of my conditions, but I at least want to be in a state where it's manageable so that I can have some kind of normality, even if it's nowhere near the normality of another person. I still need something. Um, and 
like I said, yeah, the best doctors are the ones that respect you, then you respect them back. And I've got to say, I've really been missing those doctors that um, I'm no longer seeing. I really, really feel that hole of them not being there. And it's very lonely because it's this huge worry and burden that when I get really sick, like acutely sick, like I've been in the last few weeks, that I have now have no one there who's on my side to fight my corner, who gets it, who actually wants to give the time to get it and understand it and appreciate it and not just kind of brush me off and move on to the next patient because oh she's too complicated um yeah i'll do that another vlog and i suppose the last point on that is you know i actually said to a doctor last week i got really tearful and you'll see in my previous blog that i was tearful but i got very tearful with them and i basically there was no other way i could put it i basically said to him look i said um when when these symptoms were bad you know it was it was still manageable enough that I was able to still get up and do things and make my life worthwhile. But in the last kind of couple of months, everything has been so severe that, you know, I'm no longer in control. My health is entirely in control of me and I'm completely, um, you know, it, it sometimes feel, it's a horrible word, but it does feel like you're crippled by it. Um, that there's no way out of it that whatever I try that I'm never going to achieve any of my potential because I can't like this um it's basically a begging plea please help me because I can't and to the idea of continuing like this um you know I actually said to him well what is the point in living if you can't actually achieve any of your potential or you're doing is suffering um which I think is a really potent question and you know um I I crave to be alive but I want to feel like I'm alive I want to do things that make me feel alive um, and I need their care and understanding in order to achieve that um, and I think that's what a lot of doctors lack and don't understand um, I say doctors but I'm talking about obviously medical professions in general um, but yeah okay I talked way too long for that but you know this is like I said it's a chain of thought it's what I'm feeling it's what I want to share with you and I said you know these recurrent um, themes in my blogs will continue to come up because these are big reasons why I'm doing them so and that's really really important for me being the voice for not just for myself but for other people out there who are too exhausted and ill to fight their corner um who have been mistreated and like me just feel like invisible and that kind of lost in that blackness um so currently in the situation so you'll know from the last few blogs what's been going on um, so I finally, and this is what you have to do, like I said, you have to fight your corner. Finally, after a lot of phone calls and pressurising and getting to see a doctor and insisting that I wouldn't leave without some kind of plan put in place, we actually, touch wood, seem to be getting, moving, not moving, I'll say inching forward like a snail, because that's the only thing you ever do when you're chronically ill. Um, so I'm now, yesterday I started a course of steroids. Um, now, steroids I can only be on for a very short period of time because steroids for all their wonderful benefits have an awful lot of very complicated side effects and you should not be on them if you have PCOS like me because it can make you become insulin resistant and therefore give you diabetes it also affects your weight so but when you're on it just for a short period of time it basically gives you some respite from the symptoms and that's basically the idea here is to go back onto the steroids um, and I think the bone consultant basically he wants to see whether I get a vast improvement in my symptoms again because if I do that pretty much confirms that there is a general inflammation right across my body which is what was suspected but because they have no actual scans or means to uh, detect inflammation inside soft tissue rather than just bones and organs um, it means that it's kind of just speculation and going on symptoms um, but this will confirm, you know, last time when I had to go on it for a short period of time, it improved things. So it'll be very curious again now to see it. And I really need it because I've been feeling really rotten. So I am hoping that, you know, um, it will do what it did last time. Um, and then after that, so the plan is a very tricky one because I need to be going on to a medicine trial of a drug called um, sulfizapan, um, which is a really hardcore, strong Drug. It's actually grouped in the immune, immune, immune suppressant drugs, although technically it doesn't actually suppress your immune system, so that's a little bit misleading. Um, 
But the reason why, so my doctors have all been conflicting on this. One of them's like, oh, I really don't want a young 28-year-old to go on this. The other one's like, it's absolutely fine. It's blah, blah, blah. Um, I basically said to them, look, I said, look, I don't like being on drugs. I don't know anyone that does. Um, I don't like popping pills. I have already tried to remove some of the medicines that I was on that I felt were a bit pointless, which I managed to for some and not for others because my body has become too dependent on them and I can't do without them. And you have to have a certain level of just acceptance with that when you're unwell, whether it's chronically or acutely, you probably will need to take some medicine. You just have to accept that. It's not nice being kind of like, you know, knowing that you're always shackled down to having to take it and remember to take it. But that's just life for a lot of people. Um, but the thing is, is that um, so I said, look, you know, I don't, I don't want to be I'm not taking this because I want to be adding to my medicine list here. Um, I'm taking it because you're telling me that this drug might be like last chance for loons, saloons for me, like the last drug that will actually be effective against my symptoms. Yeah, I know, you know, it's not realistic to think for a minute that there's a magical drug that's suddenly going to like stop all my symptoms because there isn't. I'm still going to get the symptoms. But I said to him, you know, even if the medicine improves my symptoms by just 30%, you know, dies down the pain, dies down the nausea, improves my sleep so I can feel a bit less tired. Even a small improvement for me is a huge improvement. That's what I don't think they really appreciate. Um, and I need an improvement because I can't stay like this on this kind of level. So yeah, you know, weighing it up, yeah, it's not great. I really don't want to go on a hardcore drug, but if it's going to be only, the only thing that's going to help me, then so be it that I don't, don't see any way around it. Um, so, you know, I do find it a bit irritating, but also a bit amusing when doctors are kind of like, oh, but you're young and I'm not kidding. I'm thinking, are you actually listening to me and listening to the symptoms I'm telling you I have and seeing how ill I look and this and that It's incredibly frustrating. Um, and like I said, you know, the doctors that I was close with professionally who really respected me and I them um, are no longer in my care system. And so I feel almost like every time I'm speaking to a doctor that I have to fight my corner really hard and that's really exhausting and really difficult. But basically they've concluded after a lot of miscommunication and letters that were incorrect and oh my God, like you think you would be dealing with school children. Um, is that, yes, I will be going on a medicine trial of this drug. The big crux of the problem that I've talked about before is, as you'll know, blood taking with me is near on impossible. That's why a nurse once called me, nicknamed me Vampire Girl. Um, and although it sounds amusing, it is a really serious problem because getting blood out of a normal person is, you know, you don't even flinch an eye. It's a very simple process. It can hurt a bit. People don't like needles, but hey-ho, it's pretty normal. That's life. Um, my arms are not like that under any terms. So I had my endoscopy a few weeks ago. I was knocked out under an anaesthetic and it was only while I was asleep that the doctor was able to actually get some blood out of a much deeper vein that he wouldn't be able to access when I was awake. Um, and he said, he basically admitted, said the other veins, I cannot get blood out of them. They don't know why my veins are like this. We all assumed that after the swine flu when I was 15, that it was that that kind of made the veins collapse. But on top of that, I don't think they like to admit it, but I generally believe that this is with the situation. They gave me far, far, far too much anti-sickness into, um, into the needles and the lines that were in my arms. And it was a particular anti-sickness that has now since been banned because it caused some really nasty hardcore drugs and colluding hallucination. But one of the things it did is it would burn your veins. And I believe that basically over time they used too much on me. I was too young and it's actually damaged my veins. So the veins in my arms now are superfluous. Unless I was, you know, in a critical car crash and utterly ill, they could just stick a needle into my neck or my leg. I wouldn't even feel it. But before that, there's this issue of kind of um, welfare and what is and isn't ethical because, you know, there's only so much pain I can put up with. And I'm not talking about little cannulas here, I'm talking about pick lines and really deep needles. And you only know what I mean if you've had them done. And remember, I have fibromyalgia, which means that my my skin and especially the soft tissue on my arms is already very inflamed and painful. So stuff like that is really painful. So I know when I have to put up with it, that I just have to swallow kind of go in, you know, focused, shut up, get on with it. But there is a limit when, you know, they keep kind of stabbing me and I'm bleeding and I'm, you know, like it, it gets to a limit. Um, so we've kind of left it as he's going to contact the, um, they're called, I'm trying to remember now, 
um, intravenous access ward on our local hospital, which are basically the people that are meant to deal with the patients that, and often, you know, this is often for cancer patients or people that have been druggies who don't have any veins left to use, to access it. The funny thing is, is that I've dealt with this particular clinic many times before and we've never ever got on. There's always been conflict, um, and they have rarely managed to actually get blood out of me. So it does make me laugh because actually the ward that is meant to be the most specialist is actually the one that has probably failed me the biggest, and actually they've been successful elsewhere where they haven't been specialists. So um, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But, for example, so on this um, particular clinic in the hospital, they have um, ultrasound machines designed to scan your arms. Um, so it's the same thing with jelly and stuff, but it's to see where your big veins are. And they've done this with me multiple times. And you're sitting there and you can see on the screen where your veins are and you can see that they can see them. And yet they put the needles in, but can they get them into the vein? No, because the veins move and they're too deep and they don't put them in the right angle. And you just, you get to this point of despair because something so simple is not so simple. And that's a big problem because with my conditions, I need at least six monthly checkups of my bloods to check levels. And I've not been getting that because of the huge drama that it takes to get blood out of me. This is a huge problem. No one has actually sat down with me to try to think of other options or resolve this. Um, and so this is a, always like a constant worry, especially when I'm feeling unwell. I'm like, oh God, they're going to want bloods. How are they going to get bloods? Um, and yeah. It's not, it's not a nice place to be. So I'm waiting to see what he says, especially because for this medicine trial, I have to have bloods every two weeks for eight weeks. Um, now, they might be lucky once to get cannula in, to get one lot of bloods. So that would be like gold dust for me. Um, but to do it that many times, realistically, it's never, ever going to happen. Um, so he has, my GP has tasked himself with contacting that ward and figuring out some kind of plan because there is no way around it. I have to have bloods checked for that because that medicine's hardcore and it can cause all sorts of complications within the first six months. Um, how they're going to do it, I don't know. And I have a bad feeling that it's going to involve me having to have a pick line put in. Um, but pick lines are only really meant to have for two to three weeks, which means I. this is my theory and I'll bet money on it and I'll let you know if this is true. I think what they're going to want to do is put a pick line into one of my arms and then send me home with it in. And then after two two weeks um take it out and put one into my other arm and do it alternatively um that idea actually terrifies me and makes me literally want to run away um because as i talked about before i don't have many phobias or scares um but one thing i do have is real trauma when it comes to having pit lines put in because i was forced at a very young age to have one put in and it's one of those things if you have it in now some people are supposed to say it's not so bad for them and i think it might be to do with the fact that i have a bone condition, the arthritis running in my family and also the fibromyalgia, so I think it feels worse to me than it would if you didn't have those conditions. But then I've also talked to people that agree that it is horrendous. And the thing is, is they play it down really big. So they make it out that it's a really small thing and it's not gonna hurt at all. But if you step back and think about effectively what they're doing, they slice into, and I'm not talking about a little vein, I'm talking about a big vein right up here in your arm. They numb your skin with a tiny little bit of numbing stuff, which does absolutely fuck all. They might as well not put it on my skin. And last time they also gave me gas and air. Um, I hate gas and air. It just makes me feel sick and dizzy and it doesn't help with the pain again. Um, I wish they would just knock me out doing it, but apparently they're not allowed to do that. Um, but anyway, so this is not a small vein talking about. They actually make a cut, an incision, straight into one of your large veins. And then they feed a tube. And I've seen it when it's been pulled out of me. It's a long, it's a long tube. Um, and it goes basically from the top of your arm here, round and into your chest to about there. And I gotta say, I've had a lot of nasty procedures done and a lot of nasty tests done, but it still stands as number one hatred for me. As soon as I know I'm having one in, my heart starts racing, I get tearful, I wanna run away, I freeze up, it's absolutely terrible. Um, and all the memories come flowing back of all the other times I've had it done and the pain of feeling the tube pushing up your vein into your chest is ghastly. And I'm not trying to scare anyone here, I'm just telling you my experience. Like I said, some people have said it's not so bad, so maybe it's more on my part. But um, And then the thing is, is once it's in place, um, <coughs> you it's a lot long-lasting than the cannula, so you can come home with it. And I have been at home before with a pick line in, 
um, but only for about a week like when I've been having antibiotics and stuff but I can't do anything with it I'm completely handicapped basically one side of me has become useless because whichever side of the arm that it's in um, I the pain that my arm is in I have to wear it in a sling because the actual weight of my lower arm is I can feel the, the pressure put on the tube in my arm it's, it's horrible it's literally horrible um, so I have to wear my arm in a sling um, so therefore it has to ideally be in the left arm because I need my right arm to write and I have to be able to write and type I can't text or do anything like that even moving my lower arm when I've got a pick line in is agony I can feel it right down my whole arm sleeping absolutely none when I have a pick line in because I'm a side sleeper and I'm constantly turning from one side to another and you can't sleep at all on that side of the pick line when you have it in I've tried it and it's it's the most horrible sensation on the planet because when you turn onto this side of your chest and you have the tube there you can actually feel it almost pressing up near your heart it actually gives me palpitations it's horrible um, and I just cannot sleep just on one side so it's it's ghastly also you can't do basic stuff I can't shower when I have a pick line in it can't get wet I can't wash my long hair I can't pick up my pet ram and groom her I can't work out you know jumping or lifting weights I can't do anything like that um so therefore how do I do simple things like my little pet care jobs that keep me going with small amounts of money and um you know my driving lessons and anything else you can't so so I'm worried now because I'm thinking, oh my God, are they actually going to say to me that for four to eight weeks I'm going to be completely impotent and that I'm not going to be able to work out? And that's awful, especially because, um, you know, I've been working so hard to keep physically fit and I've got to a point now where I'm really quite happy with my body. I'm toned on my stomach. I've got muscle. Um, and that's only because I force myself to work out a certain amount of times a week, even when I'm not feeling well. But if I have a pick line put in, I can't do sod all. Um, and that's really unfair because then as that time goes on I get achy, I feel my muscle going, um, and my back hurts more, it's just, it's not good. So these things set you back constantly, it's like this cycle when you're chronically ill, the things are always setting you back. So that's where I'm at at the moment. Um, also, so I'll let you in, so um, the other thing that was discussed. So one of the few tests that I've not had done is a colonoscopy. So I've had an endoscopy. So an endoscopy is basically down the throat into the stomach and kind of around that area. A colonoscopy is up your bum. Um, and I don't know why for years I thought I was, well, I've been absolutely terrified of the idea of having one because I thought that you were awake, but apparently you're asleep, same as when you have an endoscopy. So maybe it's not so bad. Um, but I'd always put it off and put it off. And I remember one of my doctors, one of the ones that I really respected years ago, saying another doctor wanted me to have it done. He said, no, she's too young. She's already traumatised. Leave it. Um, but it's now... I knew at some point it would come back to bite me, and it has now. Basically, the doctors that I do have are now kind of all uniting in the fact that they want me to have one done because um, they feel it could shed some light on some of the kind of mysterious symptoms I'm getting that don't quite fit in with other things. Um, I have a lot of gastric problems, as you know, a lot of vomiting and stuff that's strange. But what kind of is a big factor in suggesting that I do have some kind of um, digestive disease, like um, inflama inflammation bowel disease, um, is the fact that when I take steroids, these symptoms improve and steroids douse inflammation. So it fits in with that. And unfortunately, so I've had a lot of scans and other doctors kind of be like, yeah, the scans look normal, therefore we're going on the crocs, it's unlikely that there's anything going on in your bowel. Um, but the fact is, is that they can't 100% rule out stuff without doing a colonoscopy. So I know that I've now probably hit the time where I'm going to have to just concede and agree to it. Um, again, this is a test that I'm really anxious about having. I suppose it is kind of embarrassing when you like the idea of, a bit like when a girl has her first internal examination, it's quite embarrassing, but also a little bit traumatic. Um, but then if I'm asleep, it probably won't be so bad. But what I'm more worried about is before and after, because after I know that I'm going to bleed, that my bum's going to be really sore and that I may not go to the loo for weeks. So normally you feel that's really sore after, whether it's with an endoscopy down your stomach, you don't really feel anything other than a slightly sore throat from where they've put the tube down. Um, and also before, you know, it's little things that again for a healthy person wouldn't be a problem, but for me are tricky. So for two days before you can't eat solid food, um, I'm going to, so that, you know, you're going to be starving, living off drink. That's a problem because too much liquid makes me vomit. And even though I'm not diabetic, I do have problems with my sugar levels. So I'm not sure how that's going to be managed. Um, but then also, you'll know if you've had it done, you have to take laxatives for like a whole day before so that your bowels are completely empty. Um, so it sounds really ghastly and I really, really 
it's a tricky one. I know that I need it done. I have because I have a feeling that it will shed some light on something. Um, but I'm just not looking forward to the process. Um, so yeah, that's where I'm at, at the moment. So hopefully this steroid course will give me a bit of respite. Um, and obviously I'll be monitoring my symptoms and I have to let them know next week which symptoms have improved and which haven't. Um, and then hopefully some kind of blood taking plan in order to get onto this um, sulfazepam. I just don't know how it's going to work. I have to wait and see what they suggest. I know I'm not going to like it. I know there might be a lot of arguing. Um, it's not an easy one. And like I said, you know, if I hadn't pressed this, I wouldn't have even got this plan put in place. You know, it was me and my mum constantly nagging, constantly contacting doctors, constantly sending letters because, you know, in there, oh, we'll get back to you, but they never do. Oh, the letter went missing. Oh, this, oh, that. And at the end of the day, you know, they do make you feel like they don't care, um, like your life is meaningless. Um, and it's, it's, it's a really tricky one. Um, I actually saw on the news the other day, they were talking about all the junior doctor strikes and they were interviewing this lady, the blesser, who's had her operation paused like six times. And she just said, they should get back to work, she said. She said they're actually being paid quite well, which I agree with. Um, you know, £19 an hour for being a junior doctor is very good. And you could say, well, their job is extremely stressful. But having stayed in hospital multiple times and seen what some of them get up to and use their time with, um, I would say that that is more than a good level of job. My partner only gets about 11 no, he only gets about £9.50 an hour for being an ambulance care assistant. So, you know, there's a big discrepancy there, yet he's still going to work and not striking. Um, so I'm not sure that I do and don't agree with it. I think I'm kind of on the fence. But obviously, as being an ill person, I'm on the side of the patients and totally on the side of that lady. You know, can't they see the suffering that it's creating for people? Um, and especially when the strikes don't seem to be having much effect on the government, um, all they're doing is just making the problem even worse for the patients and the ill people. And she was desperate and you could see it in her eyes. And I feel like, you know, the last thing that I'll finish on this vlog is, you know, I feel like there have been people who have taken their own life because they couldn't cope with living with chronic illness or waiting for an operation or other things and I wonder in those cases how often the healthcare profession actually stand up hold up their hands and actually say actually this was probably down to us because um we didn't do this we didn't check in on her when we were meant to we cancelled this multiple times we showed no sign of care and affection um and you know that sort of stuff causes someone to want to kill themselves I've been there I still often get those thoughts I would never do it because I um you know I respect myself too much but the point is, is it's a really horrible feeling, feeling like that. And um, if you're made to feel that way by a healthcare profession that's meant to be there to care for you, I think you can't get much worse than that. I think that is the bottom of the pit. Um, and yeah, I am i don't like having to be reliant on them. I hate the fact when I'm ill because I'm like, oh my God, I'm having to rely on service. It is basically fundamentally falling apart. It's like walking across a metal bridge and all the pieces are just falling under your feet. Um, and people say, well, go private. Trust me, if I could go private, I would be shooting off to London and Harley Street in two minutes. Um, <coughs> but as far as we can see when I've investigated, no one will accept me on a private healthcare plan with all my current chronic health things. None of them would be covered for like three or four years. So it'd be a bit pointless because obviously I need regular stuff now for that stuff. Um, so I feel, yeah, sometimes like a, a bit like a leper. Um, kind of excuse the term but it does feel like no one wants to touch you no one wants to help you you're, too, you're dubbed like this big round sign on your face too complicated um, and that's just really horrible because all the problems I have none of them I've done anything to cause them none of them are my fault um, and you know it's just really difficult especially when there are things you want to achieve in life and do and you're sat there looking at other people achieving it and you're like why the fuck have i just got this worst luck in the world um and you know i i envy and i think wonderful for any people out there who are ill who have a much more positive outlook and are more like the now and again you'll see them the people who are like oh well i learned from life and i'm grateful that i'm still alive and doing this i think they're great um i'm not one of them i'm a realist and all i see is shit um, and I just feel like there's so much out there that my hands can't grab because of being let down from the service that's meant to be helping me. Um, so yeah, right, I'm going to stop there because I've been talking for way too long. But that was basically just to update you with where I'm at. Um, and just kind of a reminder also about my blogs um, and what they're really here for just to get to the crux of it. And just to remind folk out there, you know, people who have contacted me, you're not alone which is nice for me because it makes me not feel so alone. 
Um, and I am happy to be here for you guys as a voice for the people that have got invisible illnesses and chronic illnesses. Um, you know, it, I'm here to say, actually, it's okay to speak up. It's okay to say you're not happy with that. It's okay to say that you shouldn't be getting treated that way. Um, you know, it's all this, you know, British stiff upper lip. Um, it's nonsense. That's only good in certain contexts. You know, if I have to go and have a pick line put in, yeah, I'll have British stiff upper lip. I've got to do it. There's no way around it. But then also, you know, at the same time, when I can see something really bad being committed in front of me in my health system or something that should have never happened that happened, um, or someone just being really rude and unkind when they're meant to be professionally trained not to be talking about that sort of stuff, you stop and you question it. And I don't think there's anything wrong with doing that. And I think if more of us did that, then more things would actually try to change. I think that often we just think, slip under the radar, I think if we shut up, someone else will do it at some point or complain about it. But you need to be the one um, to stand up and do it. Um, okay, guys, right, I'm going to stop there talking way too long.